I'll uh, speak from over here. Um, international bureaucrats are very uncomfortable with sort of free roaming microphones and not having nameplates and that kind of thing. And I would, having grown up and gone to school in uh, New England, I can appreciate Vermont, but I'm afraid um, that the citation of English cows when we have the former Secretary General for Switzerland in the room may be a kickoff of a small international incident. So uh, I'll leave that to Thomas Zeltner um, to speak about the, this evening. But I w <laughs> see, he's already mad. If he only had a bell, he'd be waving it right now. Um, but I'm really pleased uh, that Massimo asked uh, the World Health Organization to, to come here and also really pleased that uh, Joe mentioned earlier the access issue is changing. The access to safe, high quality healthcare will be the number one priority for the world in the next uh, millennium. The Millennium Development Goals, which some of you will have heard about, conclude in 2015 and there's a big push to move on to other topics. The one topic that will stay in health, if we get any topic in health in terms of these goals, is going to be access to universal coverage. And we are pushing really strongly that it needs to be access to safe, high quality care. Now, I'm American. I grew up um, on the other coast. Um, but, and I know what it is to be an American. We're proud, we're competitive. We don't like people to tell us that maybe we don't know everything. But that is my job here today, and I'm very sorry to say that. Um, I, I think it's interesting and very open-minded of Massimo to have started a, uh, helped start a conference with a global perspective. For whatever reason, even though Americans led the work on internationalizing many, many other industries, in healthcare, we feel like no one can tell us any different and that we're an isolated island, sort of inconveniently connected to Canada and Mexico. And what I'd like to do in the next uh, session here is to go through three real themes to try and convince you that maybe, maybe there's something to learn out there. Uh, first of all, I'd like to, to touch on patients and problems worldwide and the changing uh, world of healthcare, and then uh, discuss what I term patient safety 2.0, which then the innovation exchange. And third, just to finish up on, on five priorities that the World Health Organization sees for, for patient safety and quality going forward. Uh, I'll start with, uh, if I can, the uh, issue of uh, patients and problems worldwide. Now, this is what I have termed misery without borders. And I'll just read these two quotes from people who come from a world apart. So from a woman in Uganda who lost her mother and, uh, to a healthcare associated infection. The doctors treat us as if we are plants. They care for us and water us and help us grow, but in the end, they are like farmers. They care for us for their own purposes. How can it be that they are working for us, but they do not talk to us? And then a man in New York City, it was the same year, uh, when my mother lay dying in the intensive care unit from an infection she got at her hospital, why was no one telling us what was happening? On the final day of her life on rounds, the whole clinical team came in and talked only to each other while we sat there looking at them, wanting to understand what was happening. I think that patient safety starts with a moral story. And we have to recognize that that moral story is the same globally. There's no moral reason why a woman in Uganda or a woman in New York City admitted for surgery should die from a healthcare associated infection. But these two people could not be more different in the world. There is some universal way we have constructed healthcare uh, around the world that is treating patients in a way that is less than optimal. Now, reason number two why we are in the midst of a global issue and not just a uniquely national issue for any nation. First of all, the health workforce has changed since the quaint picture taken uh, in the 1970s at uh, one of the hospitals not far from where I grew up. Now, one in uh, these days, you'd be surprised to know that one in four uh, physicians working in the US is trained overseas. And uh, last year, over 30% of uh, American office visits were done by a physician who was trained overseas. Now, Linda and Lily and Julianne are coming up next. We'll speak more on this issue of nursing care. But the nurses themselves, while slightly less prevalent in terms of training overseas, there's an increasing internationality uh, about their work. There's 4% prior to 2004, and that's doubled since 2004 in terms of nurses who've trained overseas. 
drugs and our, and our medical products are increasingly uh, international. Right now, according to the FDA, 20 million products from 300,000 factories in 150 countries come into the U.S. in terms of how the medical products that we use. The U.S. imports 80% of active pharmaceutical products and 40% of drugs consumed in the U.S. come from overseas, and that's doubled since 2002. Even patients themselves are increasingly international. There's a growing uh, role of online tools. There's um, over 250,000, by latest count, of uh, Facebook and Google groups devoted to uh, patient illnesses and care-related sites. Those are all international, and there's growing medical tourism. Uh, in 2007, which unfortunately is the latest data that we have, 750,000 Americans went overseas, and that's projected to double uh, in a decade. And it costs uh, uh, U.S. Uh, healthcare providers billions of dollars. And even in the, UA, the European Union, there's a, a work right now on codifying that cross-border care in terms of a major cross-border directive. So reason number three uh, in terms of uh, the globalization of healthcare is the data. Now, healthcare continues, as you can see here, to be uh, among the most uh, dangerous and risky of uh, endeavors. Healthcare-associated infection, five to 15% of hospitals, uh, hospitalized patients acquire healthcare-associated infection, and it can be much higher in the developed world. There's five million healthcare-associated infections in Europe uh, alone. Medication errors, one of the other topics that we're dealing with here. 1.5 uh, million harmed and thousands uh, are killed in, in the uh, US every year. And in some countries, the data that we have recently, over 70% of patients' medication histories have errors. And I'll come back to some of the innovations that we've worked on to address that. There's other topics around unsafe surgery and injection uh, safety. The numbers are staggering globally. There are more surgeries done every year than there are births in the world. There are 234 million surgical procedures uh, worldwide, with 7 million complications and a million deaths. Injection safety is one of the most common procedures in healthcare. There's 16 billion given globally every year, and 70% in some cases in primary care are unnecessary, and they account for uh, at least a third of new HBV and HCV uh, injections, uh, infections. Sorry. Blood safety, there's more than 13 million transfusions a year, and I'm so pleased that, and I'll come back to it as uh, one of our priority topics, that uh, blood safety has come up finally as an issue, but this time from the patient side. Now, the data continues here. We have a tendency to get beat up in international circles. Being an American, I can uh, attest to that. I've gone out on your behalf and taken the heat from many international uh, meetings where the standard uh, line is that, well, we do a poor job public health-wise, but we're giving the best health care in the world. Well, surprise, it's not always the case. You can see here it's a little difficult uh, where the United States is slightly better than the OECD average in post-operative sepsis uh, and slightly worse than the average in foreign bodies being left in during procedures. This is OECD uh, data. And there's still a fourfold difference between where we are and the best country. And um, you may want to talk to uh, Tomas tonight uh, about uh, their work in post-operative sepsis, but you may want to leave off the conversation on foreign body left in during procedure. <laughs> in terms of where do we go from this, I, I may, I hope, at least have convinced you that there's something uh, to an international discussion on this, and we may not have everything perfectly right here. Uh, the issue is where do we find solutions? Some of them we'll find right in this room. You have excellent people talking uh, here. But in this new Patient Safety 2.0, the innovation exchange should not know national boundaries. We need to look beyond them. Uh, I think that you know, in terms of looking at uh, some of this work, we need to lend credence to some of the quotes that were brought in earlier by, uh, on Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, and the, uh, Joe's uh, great quote on the definition of insanity. Albert Einstein said, a different version of it, if you always do what you always did, you always get what you always got. Now, one of the problems is that we have been looking at, if we take some of these quality and safety building blocks, which is a, this is an adapted view from WHO's building blocks of health systems, think of it in the same way that Chuck presented the leadership practices and technology. Where we have spent our time working in the past and in the past century has been on infrastructure, on access, on design, and on skills. Where we need to be in terms of working forward is working on issues of leadership and management, standards of assurance and patient-centeredness, and looking at procedures. 
This to me maps well to Chuck's, uh, the, the framework that we're using for this conference on leadership practices and technology. So where are the innovations in leadership? What we have tried to do at the World Health Organization is take the question of leadership and uh, head on, adopt the issues of political campaigning to healthcare safety. And our global patient safety challenges were the first challenge to the world to address uh, patient safety. We launched a global patient safety challenge 2004 to address the specific problem of healthcare associated infections and got ministers to sign up to commit to uh, address healthcare associated infection. And we now have over 124 countries, 89.3% of the world's population and 15,000 hospitals signed up. That is the fastest campaign that WHO has ever ran. And I think part of it is the message, the power behind the message and the moral story that's there. But as we've seen, from those of us Americans who get CNN and uh, international and we watch from afar the goings on in Washington, political leadership can be fleeting. And right now uh, in uh, the US, uh, that policy support uh, is, is questionable in my own humble opinion. Let me, let me talk about innovation in other areas, pairing community engagement and partnerships, product innovation and improvement, and in standards and procedures. In terms of partnerships, the, the work that we need to do is to be able to build partnerships across organizations. We have a partnership that pairs hospitals working in Europe uh, as well as hospitals working in the Southern Hemisphere to address basic patient safety issues. And uh, if you take one example of the hospital is pictured here, Kasizi Hospital uh, in Uganda. It's 10 hours drive from Kampala, the, the capital. It's working with a hospital in England, Chester Hospital. And they've completely reformed the way the hospital uh, runs. And I'll uh, come on to that. And this kind of approach has been codified in some ways and picked up on, even in US legislation. Um, California's own uh, Howard Berman uh, just recently introduced a long-awaited bill uh, in Congress, uh, uh, the Global Partnership Act of 2012, which is designed to replace the Foreign Assistance Act of 1961 and the Arms Export Control Act uh, to look and, and encourage the elements, the fundamental change that it proposes is changing the donor-recipient relationship to one of equal partners uh, working together. So what did, these, what did this innovation exchange do that transformed the hospital? Well, there, there was an early focus on uh, elimination of healthcare-associated infection. All staff were trained on proper uh, technique. There was work on measuring and changing the culture. Uh, and in terms of making hand hygiene and, and healthcare associated improvement part of daily life. And the community was engaged as well in that. They were, the, in many ways, many of the communities that I work with in, in Africa and Latin America are far, far beyond the, the uh, consumer driven healthcare that we strive for here in America in terms of how involved they are in their, in their uh, local hospital. And in fact, the community in, in this particular case was so incensed at the lack of progress in the initial part of the project that they pooled money and made a, a dance. That they danced, they employed dancers to dance outside the hospital until the CEO was shamed enough to sign the pledge and start working. Um, I do not have that uh, video of that uh, dance, but I'll be pleased to send you the link to it on YouTube. Uh, innovations come not just from places where WHO works uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, but from the Northern Hemisphere as well. Hospitals prescribing in the Netherlands, working between Canada and the Netherlands, we helped encourage a partnership around medication errors. Now, I spoke earlier about uh, uh, medication errors and that we've talked as uh, a focus for this particular uh, event. And uh, you know, some recent studies put the figure around 2.8 million even for just one hospital. As, uh, in terms of cost. The work that, that the Netherlands did to adapt Canadian standards of medication reconciliation were focused on standardization. And this is one of the tools that we need to keep in our basket as we move forward in terms of innovation. They worked on uh, a, a, an SOP that had event analysis paired with it, patient safety culture surveys before and after, and uh, in-depth interviews with the uh, providers and leadership. So you can see that the culture piece and the intervention piece go hand in hand. Now, the question is, can we reverse some of this innovation? And where can we learn back here in the US, back in, in, in London, uh, back in Sweden, about some of the work that's going on in other countries? We just uh, have seen a recent publication, a really groundbreaking publication on uh, the reverse innovation that identified 10 key areas where developed countries have the most to learn from 
the developing world. And this is relevant both for entrepreneurs who are working out there in the private sector as well as healthcare institutions. And these span from rural health service delivery, skills substitution, a decentralization of management, uh, education and communicable disease control, and innovation in mobile phone use. Uh, in uh, mobile phone penetration in India is outstripping that in the United States. And the work that we're doing on delivering some of those uh, uh, messages both to clients and to health providers on mobile phones uh, is the next frontier for us in terms of safety. We've also worked on low technology uh, training in terms of simulation uh, with colleagues at Imperial College uh, developed for work in, in Africa that can be deployed in rural settings anywhere. And this is the kind of work that needs to be thought of back in America. And part of the issue, I really think, is that resources are so constrained in these places. So there is no option for purchasing a higher cost uh, pulse oximeter or higher cost CT scan. They have to purchase something cheap. So they develop something cheap and they save money. We need to be thinking in those, uh, in those terms. So let me just uh, try and uh, move to the, the last section and talk about a few priorities uh, where WHO in its humble opinion, sees the, the next steps. And these are the top priorities that the World Health Organization will ask every country, the United States included, and Secretary Sebelius sticking around, has been a close working partner of, uh, of WHO, um, from 2013 to 2015. First of all, to improve medication safety. Now, we'll have a bit of a talk, perhaps a bit later uh, today, about specific actions by WHO in this regard. But we need to be considering elements of uh, electronic medication systems and hospital formularies and error reporting. But we need to pair them with those elements that Chuck outlined earlier, with the practices that are improved, but also with new technology and leadership. And where are those leadership innovations and technology innovations going to come from? That's what we together in this room need to answer. We need also to ensure safe blood transfusion practices. As I said earlier, blood safety has been a major public health problem for decades, but we've looked at it solely from the product side. We've been fighting the situation as if it's a, an issue of medicines and products and completely forgotten about the patient. And if we've forgotten about the patient, we've never even thought about the donor in terms of safety. Some of the issues that we need to be addressing are prevention, early diagnosis, and effective treatment of the conditions that could result in the need for transfusion and dealing with those before they are, such as anemia and pregnancy. Critically assessing the need for transfusion-based objective criteria uh, and uh, the patient's clinical condition. Appropriate prescribing of blood and blood products in accordance with national transfusion guidelines and encouraging and strengthening hospital transfusion committees. Finally, we need to work on reporting of adverse events associated with transfusion. And most importantly, most importantly, we need to uh, responsibly manage the world and the nation's blood supply. We need to work together on developing guidelines, tools, and awareness to avoid unnecessary transfusions. And partly, one of the reasons we were so excited to come here was one of the focuses on this. Number three, we need to create change that lasts. And, and we'll all have the very good fortune to hear from Peter uh, Pronovos tomorrow, but we've worked with him uh, to uh, address some of these issues around, ch around culture change. <clears throat> Pardon me, if I can permit myself, as someone who's worked for the past couple decades in, in quality and safety, we have spent the time, as you heard a bit earlier, addressing the low-hanging fruits and addressing uh, the, the projects that we could get out of the gate quickly on. Now, while that's a, not a bad idea from in terms of project work, we have exhausted our clinical staff. We have got projectitis, as it's termed, and to the point where we've got nations like the United Kingdom, who was one of the leading nations in patient safety, closing its National Patient Safety Agency, and another, other European countries considering <coughs> doing the same thing. We need to link these efforts up and move on from these isolated, uh, isolated project work. Peter will talk a bit about this more tomorrow, but one of the things we're working on now is rather than specific technical interventions, to talk about what is the package that goes with that. What's a package that could make change happen in 194 countries? We need to prepare the health workforce. This is our fourth priority. This moves us back upstream, and this and my last priority will we'll end on. We will never fill the patient safety and quality gap if we don't deal with the future of the health workforce. As my uh, earlier slides indicated, we cannot just be concerned about how we educate young doctors and nurses in America. I mean, the globalization has already come to the health workforce. We worked with 
for this particular uh, innovation with five of the international associations in uh, medicine, nursing, uh, dentistry, midwifery, and, and pharmacy to create a, a multi-professional guide. Now, some of you are already involved in, in patient safety courses in curricula, and <clears throat> building that uh, healthcare workforce of the future is going to be one way that we'll, we'll move beyond. And my final priority is that we need to engage patients with patients. Now, <clears throat> Nancy and others will, will speak more eloquently on this than I can, but uh, <clears throat> it's uh, an amazing event that we have someone from the World Health Organization, the definition of international bureaucracy. If you could take healthcare and make it less passionate, the WHO, uh, you wouldn't find a better place than WHO. And the, um, the, it's amazing that even our Director General stood up in front of the International Society for Quality and Healthcare earlier this year and made a speech saying that, we, that patient safety is the rising star of global health, of global health, not just of the quality and safety world, of global health, and that patients need to be the focus. Um, we started one of our first initiatives in Patients for Patient Safety, uh, designing to create a global network of patient champions. We now have 250 champions around the world, and I'll, I'll introduce you to one of them uh, with a video in just one second, but we're, we're working now on moving beyond that. We need to start creating tools for patients, and this tool here, the mobile phone tool called the Mother Baby M Check tool, was developed <clears throat> by our global patient safety champions uh, working around the world. And it, there's applications in other, in other areas on medication management and vaccinations. So I'll finish just on that note with one uh, story. And I think, you know, uh, this gets back to where I began, sort of the misery without borders. Um, Ray was born in Nairobi in 2005. He had sickle cell anemia. He's the first child of Patrick and uh, Fulada. And his parents called him Ray because um, it was the uh, God's ray of hope <coughs> on their family. Um, she had had uh, four, pardon me, miscarriages uh, and were very pleased to have this uh, baby boy. Ray was uh, circumcised under uh, anesthesia, and, but when he returned home, he had spiking fevers. And he went into the hospital. He began to deteriorate further, vomiting constantly, despite being given anti-vomiting drugs. And, and the doctors repeatedly administered these drugs, despite the, the lack of effect. Um, uh, three days, five days, rather, after he was admitted, uh, his mother noticed that his neck was stiff. And she asked for the doctor. And after a long wait, <coughs> pardon me, she finally found one. But when he came, to uh, speak to them, he reattached the drip and then left, uh, explaining that he wouldn't double as a ward doctor and a casualty doctor. And uh, if I can, we can just uh, turn to her explanation of the story from that point, uh, she can explain to you how she really felt. And I told him, you cannot leave us like this. Why don't you give some direction to the nurses because they don't seem to do anything without a doctor's instruction. He told me that he could not double as a casualty doctor and a ward doctor. That took away all the energy I had left to fight, to save my baby's life. Because I was saying, if a doctor can walk away in the condition the baby was in, it wasn't nice. He was lying there on the bed. He started twisting, you know, telling the nurses the baby's having a stroke. His head started swelling. They did not administer any first aid. The baby just lay there, succumbing to the disease. And the nurses watching. They did not commit to saying what was. So eventually, um, Midday, they called me and told me that it was useless. On top of the mistreatment um, or the professional negligence I had suffered, they were actually digging more into my pocket by just keeping my baby on a machine for days. The doctor in charge, he, he refused completely to talk to me. And that really hurt me because I was just trying to find 
an apology, I think, that was very important for me. Now, what was it that broke Fulata's spirit? <clears throat> it was the systematic, <coughs> pardon me, lack of communication and compassion that was shown to her. Now, Fulata is a businesswoman in Kenya, but I mean, she could have been living in LA and we could have taken that film right out here on the beach. It was uh, Lake Victoria there in Uga uh, Uganda where we had the meeting. She could have been in Washington. We could have been sitting by the, by the Potomac River. She and champions in East Africa like her, though, have gone on to do amazing, amazing things, organizing for improved patient safety in Kenya and Uganda and other countries, working with policymakers and direct engagement with ministers and, the, and directly with the president of their countries on patient safety as a priority. Now, tomorrow, we'll have for the first time a former president addressing directly the issue of patient safety. So maybe Africa is a little bit ahead of us on this issue. Now, I'll come back to where I began. Our patients live and die every day in a healthcare system that's become global. It's global in its workforce, in its medicines, and in the misery that mistreated patients suffer. But now it's becoming global in its solutions. Now, my fellow Americans, and I have always wanted to say that phrase, um, <laughs> my fellow Americans, I'm here at this conference today to tell you that Patient Safety 2.0 is here. And it's come on the backs of an army. It's a, an army of people like Fulata, making use of mobile tools and social networking and grassroots and community engagement to make changes. It's on the army of practitioners who learned first about safety here in America, but they've moved on to new areas of innovation and adaptive solutions to achieve improvements in safety gaps that we once really only dreamed about. And it's an army that together with yourselves will base our next successes on the free exchange of innovation. I mean, it's an army that's at the door. So let's go and open the door. Listen, I want to thank very much uh, Joe and his team uh, for pulling this together and, and having us come. And a special thanks to, to Chuck Denham, who's become a real close personal friend recently. He I mean, his team's uh, fingerprints are all over the agenda. <laughs> Um, and I really uh, would ask you to please, please, please come and uh, see me uh, during the conference and uh, come and talk to us afterwards. We're not so far away, and Geneva's a nice place to visit. Thanks very much. Thank you.